so yeah, I'm Mike Malone. Uh, like I said, I just sounds shock. I grew up in Annapolis, so it's like to be talking to uh, Marylanders. Um, and um, I'm the CEO, founder of Small Step, um, but really I'm, I'm a nerd. I'm a software engineer. Um, I like to say my happy place is distributed systems architecture. Um, so I like to build big software systems and, and build teams that build big software systems. Um, and uh, I, I've done a bunch of open source, open standard stuff. Um, but what I'm here to talk about today is the step tool chain. Um, it's on GitHub, github.com slash small step. Small step is what we refer to as an open core company. So basically our core technology is open source. And then we have a few products that we build on top of the open source offering. Um, but the open source tool chain is super powerful. And um, what we're going to be talking about today is almost entirely in open source. It's all MIT licensed, Apache 2 licensed. So um, it's all out there. Um, there are two components that I'm going to be talking about um, that work together. Uh, Step CA is a certificate authority service that you can run yourself that exposes a JSON HTTPS API for automated certificate management. And I'm going to sort of be unpacking a lot of this stuff as we go. So if, if there are words in there that you don't totally understand, I'll cover them in a minute. Um, Step is a command line tool that integrates with Step CA to streamline certificate management workflows. Okay, um, so that's a, a super, you know, 50,000 foot level. So here's our agenda. Um, it sounds like Chuck already did some of this, so I'll try to keep it brief, but I wanted to start out with um, sort of a gentle introduction slash refresher on what actually is public key infrastructure, what are certificates, what's a certificate authority. So a little bit of theory and definitions and um, a few real world use cases to sort of prime things about like why you might want certificates. Um, hopefully that'll be pretty quick. Um, after that, I'm just gonna jump into a demonstration of how to set up Step CA and start issuing certificates and automating certificate management. Um, I'm gonna do a quick demo of that. Uh, I wanna dig a little bit deeper into two of our provisioning mechanisms that are particularly popular and interesting and why they're popular and interesting. Those are the ACME and OIDC provisioner. Um, so that's gonna be sort of the demo of the X509 TLS certificate management stuff. Then hopefully we have time and I'll be able to do a little bit of a demonstration of our SSH functionality. Um, which also is certificate based. Um, talk a little bit about that. And hopefully there should be some time at the end for questions. Anything else that anyone wants me to cover that's not in here or any questions before we get started? Okay, cool. All right, jumping into it then. Um, before we talk about certificates, let's talk about signatures. Um, so signatures, digital signatures, are actually a lot like sort of physical world signatures. They're used to verify who sent a message. Um, and they use public key cryptography or asymmetric cryptography. Um, so signatures, uh, asymmetric crypto is super cool. I like, I, I, I like to call it sort of like a magical gift from mathematics to computer science. And it uses these key pairs and um, what it lets you do is you can prove that someone knows a private key. This the, you know, key here is a public and a private portion. And you can prove that somebody knows that, uh, the private key without knowing the private key yourself. So you can use the public key to prove that somebody knows the private key. And that becomes really important for authentication, which is what the main thing that you're going to be using certificates for, is, is proving who sent a message. Um, because to generate a signature, you need a private key, right? But to verify a signature, you only need to know the public key. And you can't generate a signature using the public key, okay? So if I, I, I might be the only person that knows a particular private key, right? And all of you know my public key. I can sign something and you can verify the signature and you know that the only way that that signature was produced was by me because I'm the only one who knows the private key, right? So yeah, if I know Alice's public key, 
I can tell if I'm actually talking to Alex. And the way I might do that is I could just generate a big random number, say six, and say, Alex, sign this. And uh, like, you know, if it's a big random number, bigger than six, uh, like it's unlikely that Alice will have ever, or anybody will have ever produced a signature over that random number before. Um, so if I get a signature over that random number back, that uh, that verifies, um, I've now sort of challenged Alice and got a re response. So I, I can be pretty certain that I'm talking to Alice. So like real protocols are a lot more sophisticated than that, but like really that's the core of how certificate-based authentication generally works, right? Um, so that's really cool. So with asymmetric cryptography, I can authenticate a person, um, but there's a problem. Um, in order to authenticate somebody, um, you need to know their public key. So you need to know the public key of everybody that you talk to. Um, and the way that you learn those public keys has to be secure because if someone can lie to me and be like, hey, Carl's uh, public key is whatever, and, and, it, like, and maybe tell me that Carl's public key is actually their public key, then they can pretend to be Carl, right? Because I, I'm sort of confused about what Carl's public key is, right? Um, so if you talk to a lot of people and you have a big system with like lots of interconnecting parts, then like making sure that every component knows every other component's public key can be really challenging. So enter certificates. Um, so certificates can be sort of intimidating, um, especially a lot of it, like the formats and stuff, it's sort of this Baroque like corner of computer science that like not a lot of people have a lot of familiarity with. Um, but fundamentally a certificate's a really simple thing. It's a data structure that binds a name to a public key. So you can think of it as just sort of like a two tuple. I mean, again, real in the real world, and I'll show you an example of a real certificate in a second, like there's more information in there, but really like the whole purpose is for me to learn somebody's public key if I don't already know it. So it's a, a name and a public key, and it's signed by a certificate authority. So a certificate authority is just some entity out there that I trust to prove who people are and issue certificates to them. So um, like if Maxi, Mike Maxi doesn't know Carl's uh, uh, public key, but he trusts me, then um, I can figure out who Carl is, sign over, you know, Carl comma his public key, and then Carl can send that to Maxi. And Maxi can verify my sig verify that the signature over that two tuple and know that I I'm basically asserting I'm saying Carl's public key is X and Maxi can can trust that assertion and we can sort of build up from there right so that's how certificate certificates are sort of building on this asymmetric signature or um, so yeah so it simplifies the problem because instead of everybody knowing everybody's public key and it's sort of this end to end situation. Uh, everybody just needs to know the certificate authority's public key. And then you use certificates to securely learn public keys of everybody else. Okay. So hopefully I haven't just confused everybody more. Um, but but that, that's like the, the fundamentals here. Um, stop me if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. So, so the, the main thing to know is certificates are hard. Yeah, yes, but but they don't have to be, and 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 hopefully I can demonstrate that once we get to the command line. Hopefully, some of this stuff will start making more sense. It, everything's hard in the abstract. So here's a real certificate. So real certificates have a little bit more in them. It's more than just a name and a public key. Uh, importantly, certificates also have a lifetime. So these assertions, when I'm saying like, "Hey, Carl's public key is is X." I don't want that assertion to be out there forever. So usually I say like, hey, at, uh, you know, as of October 14th and until October 15th, Carl's public key is X, right? Um, then there are like a lot of other metadata and extensions and stuff you can put in a certificate. Um, most of that you can sort of ignore for the most part. Um, when you need to know it, it'll be out there. But, but so fundamentally certificates bind names to public keys. Okay, a few more definitions. Um, just sort of quick level set, because I like to sort of define terminology, otherwise people get confused. So public key infrastructure, we already used that term a few times. So it's just a sort of like umbrella term for all of the code, processes, other stuff for distributing, verifying, renewing, and revoking certificates and keys. 
okay? A certificate authority is just a thing that signs certificates or issues them. Um, certificate authorities have a root certificate. The root certificate is just uh, a certificate that contains the CA's public key. Um, and it's used to verify other certificates that were issued by the certificate authority, right? So certificates in general, again, are just hammering on this point, is just a thing that binds a public key to a name that's signed by a certificate authority. Um, there are a few sort of roles in a public key infrastructure that are important. So a subscriber is a thing that's a named subject of a certificate that's issued by a CA, right? So certificates bind names to public keys. The thing that's named is the subscriber. So if I say the subscriber gets a certificate, I mean that, you know, Carl's getting a certificate from the certificate authority. He's a subscriber. A relying party is a thing that uses certificates to authenticate subscribers. TLS is a cryptographic protocol that uses certificates for authentication. It's the most widely deployed cryptographic protocol in the world. If you've ever used HTTPS, it, it, that is HTTP over TLS. Um, X509 is a standard certificate format. Um, it's used by TLS and a bunch of other stuff. And then um, a LEAF certificate, if I say LEAF certificate, I don't think I used the phrase here, but if you ever come across it, a LEAF certificate is a certificate that belongs to a subscriber as opposed to a, a the root CA certificate or the root certificate, okay? Um, last point before we get into um, use cases is, uh, and it sounds like Chuck also talked a little bit about this, is this distinction between web PKI and internal PKI. So web PKI is, if you're familiar with PKI at all, is probably the, the PKI that you're familiar with. So when you go to, it's, it's standardized, it's IETF and there's a group called the CA Browser Forum that, that sort of agreed on like all of the characteristics of what PKI. Um, and uh, all of the root certificates that belong to the certificate authorities that issue as part of web PKI, they come pre-installed on your computer. Um, so when you buy, you know, when you install Mac OS or Windows or Linux, um, the, cert, the root certificates are already on your machine. Um, and the web PKI is really important because, um, because the root certificates are already pre-installed. Um, so web PKI, certi PKI certificates are trusted by things like your web browser and Perl and like everything that uses TLS by default. So you don't need to do any special configuration or bootstrap trust to make web PKI work. This is the PKI that you're using when you go to google.com and you're using HTTPS and you get that lock icon. Um, you're using web PKI or if you get a certificate from Let's Encrypt, you're using web PKI. Internal PKI is the PKI that you run yourself for your own stuff. And it gives you a lot more control and a lot more flexibility. So you control how enrollment works, how renewal works, certificate lifetimes, authorization, and other policies. You control all the security aspects. So one problem with Web PKI is there are over a hundred certificate authorities that are trusted as part of the Web PKI. Some of them are in China, you know. So um, you're trusting a hundred plus other organizations with your security when you're just trusting that default trust bundle. Um, also, Web PKI certificate authorities just can't issue certificates for certain things. They're very constrained by the CA browser policy. They can't issue certificates for internal IP addresses they, and they can't issue certificates for internal domain names. So if you're building like a home lab or something like that and you want uh, a certificate for like a 10 dot IP address or for like foo dot local, you can't get one from Let's Encrypt. The only way to get a certificate from Let's Encrypt is to have a fully qualified public DNS domain name. And then you can get a certificate from Let's Encrypt. So there are lots of use cases where Web PKI just isn't going to work. Or if you make it work, you're really abusing Web PKI for something that it was never really designed for. Um, so really, the only downside to an internal PKI is that you have to do a few extra steps. You have to do the trust bootstrapping and configuration yourself. And you have to run the CA yourself. And that's hard. Um, but we're trying to make it a lot easier. That's what Step and Step CA is all about. So in terms of best practice, Super simple, uh, use web PKI for public stuff, use internal PKI for internal stuff. Um, 
so I'm going to move on to use cases in the demo now, but um, there's lots more information on our blog. Here's a blog post with a ton of background on PKI. Um, okay, so internal PKI. So that's sort of like theory, internal PKI use cases. Um, so in theory, certificates can be used anywhere you need certificate, uh, you need authentication. The most common use cases for X509 certificates are TLS and BTLS, that is authenticating DNS names of remote, the remote end of a TCP or a UDP connection. Uh, HTTPS, which is HTTP over TLS in either web browsers or for service to service or machine to machine HTTP like API connections. Um, mutual TLS or mutual H -H HTTPS, that's where both the client and server authenticate. So when you're in a web browser, it's only the server authenticating, but you can also do mutual TLS. Um, mutual TLS is used by a, a lot of databases, MySQL, Postgres, Cockroach, DB, Cassandra, they can all use mutual TLS. A lot of other infrastructure like Kubernetes, Kafka, RabbitMQ, gRPC, again, all use mutual TLS. Proxies, standard libraries, there's great support for TLS all over the place out there. Pretty much everything supports TLS. Um, OpenVPN and IPsec, so when you're authenticating clients, hosts, terminators, the different entities in a virtual private network, certificates are commonly used. Code signing uses certificates. Um, you can use certificates to authenticate to a wireless network using EPTLS. Um, you can also just sign arbitrary stuff using uh, a, a standard like JOT or JWS using a certificate. So there are tons of use cases for certificates. That's all X509 certificate stuff. So now on SSH certificates, SSH certificates are a different format, but same ideas. Um, SSH certificates make it easier for users and operators to manage SSH credentials. They eliminate some annoying parts of that SSH. If you ever SSH to a server for the first time and you get that warning, it's called the trust on first use warning. If you use a host certificate on that host, you won't get that. If you've ever changed the name or changed the key pair on a server, you get an even scarier warning. It's called a host key verification failure. Um, again, if you're using certificates, you won't get those. Um, Certificates also simplify provisioning and deprovisioning of SSH access, um, and they make good SSH credential hygiene, in particular credential rotation, a lot easier. Like people don't gen don't rotate their SSH keys because it's hard. So you have to push your public key out to all of these servers. With certificates, you don't have to do that. Um, and SSH certificates also work with protocols that build on top of SSH, like SCP, SFTP, and Git. Cool. So. Um, Pretty much everything can, going back to TLS here, so pretty much everything speaks TLS or mutual TLS, but if you look at documentation for most projects, what you're going to see is like project name can be easily configured to use X509 certificates for mutual authentication. Simply modify configuration file and specify your root certificate and leave certificate, right? So it's easy, except how do you get a root certificate and a leave certificate, right? That's the hard part. So. This is certificate management. So two hard problems here, and they're sort of chicken egg problems, right? The first is bootstrapping trust. So relying parties use the CA's root certificate to authenticate peers and establish secure connections, right? So how do they establish a secure connection to download the root CA certificate if they don't already know it, right? So that's a bootstrapping problem. And then there's provisioning, uh, also called enrollment or registration. So subscribers, use certificates to prove who, who they are, right? How do they prove who they are to the certificate authority to get a certificate, right? So there's sort of two bootstrapping challenges. And then to round out the certificate lifecycle, we have bootstrapping and provisioning, then there's renewal. So certificates expire, you need to renew them before they expire, otherwise you're gonna have a bad time. And then sometimes you have a certificate with a, with a lifetime, you know, that it's still active, um, but you don't need it anymore and you wanna revoke it right, before it, before it expires. So bootstrapping, provisioning, renewal, and revocation, that's the life cycle, okay? So now I'm gonna jump into the demo. Okay, everyone good? Any questions before that? Hopefully there will be some as I start demoing. All right, so I have three terminals open here. Um, in the first one, and let me know if my font's not big enough, guys. Um, I can actually, I'll just bump it up a little preemptively here. Yeah, I was going to say, if you could bump it up a couple, couple sizes. Is that better? Yeah, that, 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 that's a lot better. Thank you. Okay. Let me just make sure. I go, this was weird. Yeah. 
everybody likes accessibility. You don't have to be old. All right, um, cool. All right, so I have three terminal windows open here, all right? In the first one, I'm gonna run the certificate authority. The second one is going to be a subscriber. So I'm gonna run a server here that uses a certificate to serve some websites. And then in the last one, this is just my local terminal and I'm gonna be a relying party. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be connecting to the server, okay? And I'll try to just mention when I switch terminals so it doesn't get confusing. So I'm starting from scratch here. I have installed step and step CA on the servers. It's easy to install, the instructions are on our GitHub. Um, so from there, I, I just ran this step CA init subcommand. And it's gonna ask me a couple questions to get started. So the first one is, what do you wanna name your PKI? Let's call it C-A-L-E-G. And then uh, what DNS name is it gonna listen on? Um, I, I set up DNS ahead of this. So we have ca.caalug.step.poise. What port do you wanna listen on? We'll do 443. And then it's gonna set up uh, an initial provisioner for me. And they just want the name for that. I'm gonna use my email address because I'm gonna be the administrator for that. So I just enter my email address and the password. And that's it. And what, by providing that information, we've now just generated all the artifacts that we need for a proper online certificate management infrastructure. If you try to do this with OpenSSL, it's not gonna be that quick. So now we can run step CA in point at that uh, configuration file that was just generated. Excuse me. And, yep. Uh, quick question. Um, how do these keys, how does the stuff that you set up differ from OpenSSL, if, if at all? Um, or, and, and, and it can be as brief or technical as you want to get. But. Keep, keeping it high level, it, it doesn't really. And there's, it's basically totally compatible. Um, so this is all standards based stuff. Um, we can interoperate with OpenSSL just fine. So you could actually generate a root certificate using OpenSSL and then use step CA with that root certificate. These are sort of more advanced use cases. If people have those use cases, I'm happy to sort of address any questions about that stuff, but it's totally compatible. So, um, so, 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 so if I have a existing key, I can just pop it in and, or set of certs and just pop them in and, It'll, it'll all work. Yeah, so if you have an existing root certificate, what I would write an intermediate certificate, what I would recommend doing is just running step CA init just so you get the nice workflow workflow to generate all of the, the substructure here. And then you can see that it generated a root cert and a root key and an intermediate cert and an intermediate key. Just replace those with the ones that you already have. And you should be okay. good to go. Awesome. Thank you. So yeah. is this just a better user interface for SSL than open SSL is? That's the start. It's ho hopefully it's more than that. Hopefully that'll come. It'll come across all of the additional stuff uh, as, as we continue. Yeah. So because the next thing that I'm about to do, OpenSSL doesn't do at all, which is well, it sort of does, but not in really a production ready way, which is running an online certificate authority. So if I actually run step the step CA command now, I'm actually starting a web service that will issue certificates to authenticated subscribers. So OpenSSL doesn't do this, right? So, um, so the CA is now running. So now if I pop over, we output this root fingerprint during initialization. And we do that because, you know, that first problem, the secure bootstrapping problem, that root fingerprint is used to solve that, okay? So um, to securely obtain the root certificate, we need the fingerprint. Um, so now I'm over in my next window. So in this window, I'm gonna get a certificate for a subscriber and I'm gonna start a server. Before I do that, I need to bootstrap into the public key infrastructure. Um, so I'm gonna export fingerprint equals my fingerprint. And then I'm gonna run this step CA bootstrap subcommand. And I'm gonna tell it my CA URL, which is that, that URL we just en uh, entered and give it my fingerprint, okay? And when I hit enter here, it's gonna set up everything for the step command line tool to work on, on this machine. So this is a different machine, right? Um, it downloaded the root certificate securely using this fingerprint 
to verify that it's the actual correct root certificate. And it configured my local environment to connect to that certificate authority when I try to get a certificate using the step CLI. Okay. So this server has a different domain name. So I'm going to get a, now I'm going to get a certificate. Okay. I'm going to run step CA certificate. Uh, the next argument to this command, the first argument to this command is the, the DNF name that I want in the certificate. So I have another DNF name is hello.clug.step.toys. Um, and then I need to give it the file names that I want to write this certificate and the key out to. When I hit enter here, it's going to pick up that I have this administrative sort of provisioner set up. And it's going to ask me for the password for that provisioner. If I enter that in, it's going to complete. And um, I can actually use, again, use the step certificate inspect subcommand to inspect that certificate. So you can see we have a certificate here. There's a signature down here. Here's a public key. Whoops, I didn't mean to paste it. Uh, here's a name. Okay. So he's got a certificate. All right. Um, I'm going to move on then to just running a server and, and serving some traffic using the certificate. So um, I have a little Go program. It's just a little HTTP, HTTPS server um, that is going to load my cert and key and listen on port 443. Um, pretty simple stuff. Um, so if I just run sudo go run srp.go and hit enter, um, my server is now running, okay? And this is publicly accessible. So if you go to hello.calug.step.toys, it's out there right now. So I I'm now going to switch to my third terminal here, which is my local, okay? And, um, and well, actually to start, let me just curl that and show you what happens. So if I do curl hello.calug.step.toys slash hi, I'm gonna get an error. And curl's complaining because it's like, hey, this server is using HTTPS and it has a certificate, but I can't verify the certificate because I don't have the root certificate, okay? So this is the bootstrapping problem. I need, their, I need my root certificate on my local. So to get that, we're gonna do the same thing we did before I need my root for fingerprint, I run oops, step ca bootstrap dash dash ca URL dash dash fingerprint. And now I have my root certificate. It's right here. Okay. So now if I run curl dash dash ca cert point it at that root cert. I get a hello world, right? And that's all securely, it's all, you feel, or it's all authenticated and encrypted traffic, right? Um, another fun little thing. So um, let me just switch to my browser here. If I go um, in my browser and try to load this, you might have seen this warning screen before. This is a certificate validation failure error message. Um, and again, it's because Chrome doesn't, doesn't know the root certificate. We have a subcommand step certificate install that will install this root certificate in my system's trust store. And that's what Chrome is using. So if I run this, it's gonna ask for my root administrator password because this is a sensitive operation. But if I do that, then I go back over to my browser and I refresh, I get hello world. Okay. So this is all bootstrapping into the public key infrastructure, right? The key, the key thing here is we're teaching these these relying party components, whether it's curl or web browser or whatever, they need to know about my root certificate in order to securely communicate, right? 
So I can also uninstall that because I don't want a bunch of random certificate authorities in my trust store. And, um, and that's that. Okay. Um, so popping back over to my server, um, let's go over like the last two bits of lifecycle. So we've now bootstrapped, we've provisioned, but as I mentioned before, certificates expire. So if I do step certificate inspect dash dash short to just get sort of an abbreviated output, um, uh, hello that cert, you can see we issued the certificate for 24 hours. So it's gonna actually expire tomorrow around this time. If I wanna, if I, if, you know, if my server's still running, I need that certificate renewed. To do that, I can run step CA renew hello.cert hello.key dash dash force. The force is just saying like go ahead and overwrite the files. If I if I don't do force, it'll prompt me for that. Right. And now if I inspect the certificate again, you'll see the lifetime has been extended by about six minutes because I guess we issued the first one six minutes ago. So that's all well and good, but what you really want is automated renewal, right? You don't want to have to be connecting to your server every 24 hours and renewing the thing. And you want that auto automated renewal to start renewing sort of well ahead of expiry in case there's any network issues. And you want it to retry if there's a failure, you want it to be sort of resilient. Um, and that can be pretty complicated. Luckily, uh, we also have some uh, functionality to do that. So if I pass dash dash daemon, for this subcommand, instead of renewing immediately, it'll actually sleep. It'll inspect the certificate that I want to renew. It'll figure out what its lifetime is, and it'll wait until that certificate is two thirds of the way through its lifetime. So this is a 24 hour certificate. So two thirds is about 16 hours. It's going to wait until the certificate is about 16 hours old, and then it's going to start trying to renew. And if it has, if it encounters any errors, it's going to exponentially back off and continue to re retry for that remaining eight hours until it actually is able to renew the certificate, right? So this is completely automated. Um, and then the last sort of piece of the puzzle is we probably don't wanna have to run that manually. We probably wanna run it under uh, some sort of supervisor. So I can just toss it into system D. So here's just a little system D uh, um, unit file that uh, most of this is just scaffolding, but the important bit is, you know, we're just running step CA renew dash dash daemon down here. Um, and then I can sudo system ctl start step, sudo system ctl status step. And you can see it's sitting there waiting to renew. And now system D will make sure that thing is always running. Well, actually technically I'd have to run system cuddle enable if it was a real production server, right? So now our certificate's gonna automatically renew. Um, so last thing is, suppose we don't want this certificate anymore. Um, in that case, we should run step CA revoke, dash dash cert, hello.cert, dash dash key, hello.key. And that will mark the certificate as revoked as, at the certificate authority. And um, what that means is if I go back and I try to renew this certificate again, it's going to fail, right? And uh, it doesn't really tell me why it failed for security reasons. Like if you're unauthorized, we don't really want to give you any hints as to what the problem is. But if I pop over to the certificate authority, you can see in the error message here, it says uh, certificate has been revoked. And that's why we're not able to renew this one. So, Again, we, we have some questions about the password. That's because we were using this JWK provisioner. We have a bunch of other provisioners. So we have um, a cloud instance identity document provisioner. It works in AWS, GCP, and Azure to like these are signed assertions that your cloud, it's an API that the cloud offers um, and it, like allows you to authenticate a virtual machine in the cloud completely turnkey. You don't need a password. You don't need any other infrastructure. So we can verify virtual machines that way. Uh, we also have a Kubernetes service account provisioner if you need uh, certificates for Kubernetes pods. Uh, we have this X5C provisioner that lets you use an existing certificate to get a certificate, which sounds weird, but it's it's something that comes up a lot in IoT connected device use cases. Apologies for the like, kiddos in the background. 
But uh, anyways, as I said, the, the connected devices often come with sort of a birth certificate, like a certificate that was issued by the manufacturer and you can use it to reach it that way. Um, I wanna go a little bit deeper on two provisioners though, which are ACME and OAuth OIDC. So ACME is an IETF open standard. It's RC 8555, stands for Automated Certificate Management Environment. Um, if you've ever heard of Let's Encrypt, and it sounds like you, you, your group has talked about Let's Encrypt before, um, ACME is the protocol that Let's Encrypt uses. And Let's Encrypt issues like 1.5 million certificates per day. They serve about 80% of the web API certificates out there. They're absolutely huge. Um, the way ACME works is, so again, this sort of replaces the password. Um, instead of asking for a password or some other mechanism for authenticating, the server challenges the subscriber, subscriber to prove domain ownership by either serving a random number via HTTP or adding a random number to a DNS text record. Uh, it's an extensible mechanism. There are other challenge types, but like that's the general idea. Um, also, in general, you don't have to worry about this because one of the nice things about Acme is there's a robust ecosystem of Acme clients that just handle everything for you. And Step CA supports all of those Acme clients. So it works with CertBot, Terraform, Caddy, Kubernetes, Cert Manager, all of these Acme clients just work out of the box with Step CA if you add an Acme provisioner. So it's a really nice sort of flexible generic way to get certificates to servers. And then um, if you're doing mutual TLS and you need to authenticate people, the OAuth OIDC uh, provisioner is really powerful and really useful there. So again, OAuth OIDC is an open standard. Um, it's supported by pretty much every identity provider, D Suite, Opta, Active Directory, OS0, Keyflow, GitHub, I could go on. They all support OAuth OIDC. Um, and it, it's this familiar web-based single sign-on flow. If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say OAuth OIDC, when I demonstrate this, you're gonna immediately know what I'm talking about because you, you've for sure used this protocol before. You probably just don't know that you're using it. Um, it's like, if you've heard of SAML, OAuth OIDC is like SAML, but it's JSON. That's what I'm saying. Um, so benefits, centralized identity management for enterprise, reduce password routine for users, lets you implement strong authentication in one place. And Step CA can leverage single sign-on uh, to issue certificates. So let me demo that real quick. Okay. So the first thing I need to do is I'm gonna go back over to the CA and I need to turn on these two provisioners. So I do that to turn on ACME, step CA provisioner add ACME, dash dash type ACME is gonna turn on ACME. And then to turn on the OAuth OIDC provisioner, there are a few more flags you have to, you have to basically specify your OIDC client if you go to your identity provider documentation, they're gonna tell you how to create one of these. It's just basically a username and password for your OAuth ID, for your, for your client application here. So with those things configured, I can go ahead and start the CA back up. And now if I go back over to my uh, subscriber, my server, um, I'm going to, I'm not gonna actually install my root certificate here. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because the Acme client needs it in order to securely connect to the Acme server. So I'm gonna do that. And then now I'm, I'm not gonna use the step tool chain here. I'm gonna use this tool called CertBot that is a very popular Acme client that people will use to get certificates from Let's Encrypt. Um, but in this case, I'm specifying our server down here instead of Let's Encrypt as the Acme server to get a certificate from, right? And if I hit enter here, it's gonna take a little bit longer because it has to do this whole challenge verification thing. But now it's done. And I now have a certificate, this time issued via this Acme mechanism without a password. Make sense? So, um, I have a Python, another program. This is a, just a Python example. And this one actually requires mutual TLS. It's gonna use the uh, ACME certificate I just issued, but it also has specified that certificates are required for clients. So if I start this up, um, should be running now. I go back over to my local and I try to curl this. Now it's gonna not work. 
And the reason it didn't work is because this server requires client authentication, which means I need a certificate that identifies me in order to connect to this server. So to do that, I'm gonna use the OpenID Connect provisioner. So if I run step CA certificate, Mike at small step, dot com that's my identity and mike dot cert mike dot key i'm going to select the oidc provisioner here and it's going to actually oops it opened on a different screen let me move it over here it'll actually open my web browser to the single sign-on flow so in this case i'm using google as my identity provider I'm using g suite so if i click on my account here it'll redirect me back to say Hey, you're good. You've authenticated. And back on the command line, I now have a certificate for me as Mike at smallstep.com. So you can see the subject of the certificate is Mike at smallstep.com. Right. Now, if I pass that certificate and key into curl, in addition to the CA root cert, I'll get a response and it can actually authenticate me, knows who I am because I've provided, provided a certificate right, for mutually authenticating. 